everyone, my name is Paj Sahani. I am a third year medical student from GMERS Medical College, Himmatnagar. I trust that you all will like my explanation for the topic which I have been given, that is pathology of inflammatory bowel disease. So without further delay, let's get started. According to me, the best method to study anything is deriving as much as possible from the name itself, then jotting it down into subtopics and then diving deeper into it. So let's try this thing. The topic which I have been given is pathology of inflammatory bowel disease. So pathology includes four things basically. First one is etiology, second one is pathogenesis, third one is morphology and fourth one is clinical manifestation. Morphology is further divided into two, gross morphology and microscopic morphology. Coming to inflammation, inflammation is of two types, acute and chronic. Which one is IBD? IBD is a chronic inflammation of the bowel. So the definition of IBD is chronic plus relapsing inflammation of the bowel possibly due to immune dysregulation in genetically susceptible individuals. From the definition, we can see that three things are included in the definition. First one is genetic predisposition, second one is immune dysregulation, third one is triggered by microbial organisms. Before starting with etiopathogenesis, I would like to tell you that inflammatory bowel disease is not a single disease. It includes two diseases. First one is Crohn's disease, second one is ulcerative colitis. Let's start with the etiopathogenesis. First one is genetic predisposition. Genetic predisposition will be divided into two things. First one is HLA gene, second one is non-HLA gene. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. Due to genetic recombination, each one of us have different set of HLA genes. The, those individuals with HLA DQ4 are more susceptible to Crohn's disease, while those individuals with HLA DRB1 and HLA DR7 are more susceptible to ulcerative colitis. Coming to the non-HLA genes, non-HLA genes include three things. First one is NOT2, second one is interleukin-23 receptor, and third one is ATG16L1 and IRGM. NOT2, NOT stands for nucleotide oligomerization binding domain 2. NOT2 is a gene which codes for a intracellular receptor. This intracellular receptor is present in the PANET cells. We all have intestine. In intestine, we have got one special type of cell known as PANET cell. This PANET cell have got one intracellular receptor. This intercellular receptor is for a ligand of course. This ligand is neuramyl dipeptidase. This neuramyl dipeptidase is a component of bacterial cell wall. Which implies that this NOT2 plays a protective role in our intestine and protects us from the bacteria. If this is mutated, then the person is more susceptible to inflammatory bowel disease. And interleukin-23 receptor is present on the helper T-cells. Interleukin-23 acts on the interleukin-23 receptor which is present on helper T-cells. More specifically, the TH17 subtype. This cell then releases interleukin-17 and TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. These two things play a major role in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. The third one is ATG16L1 and IRGM. These two are the components of autophagy pathway. Autophagy is a protective mechanism against the bacteria. If these two things are mutated, then the person is more susceptible to Crohn's disease. Specifically for Crohn's disease, these two are the genes. Moving on to immune dysregulation. Right now what you are seeing is the diagrammatic representation of the normal cross-section of the intestine. But if the person is genetically susceptible and there is a trigger by microbial organism along with immune dysregulation present then it will lead to IBD. How is this what we gonna see next? There is invasion of bacteria via the M cells or between the epithelial cell gap. Then macrophages engulf it and present it to the helper T cells. Helper T cells change into the TH17 subtype and stimulate more macrophages and TH17 cells and release interleukin-17 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. This tumor necrosis factor alpha plays a major role in the IBD pathogenesis. First one, it promotes angiogenesis. Second one, it leads to panic cell necrosis. Third one, it leads to IEC death. Fourth one is it leads to disruption of the barrier function. And fifth one, it leads to exaggerated immune response. So if genetic factors are present, environmental factors are present, immune dysregulation is also present, trigger by microbial organism is also present. It will lead to immune reaction against the self antigen as well as the bacterial antigen and lead to local and systemic complications. Local complications like as you can see in this image, fistula, stricture, constriction, then local lymphadenopathy and systemic complications like conjunctivitis, uveitis, iritis, fatty liver, then uh, liver abscess, large joint arthritis. So this was the etiopathogenesis of IBD. Now morphology and clinical manifestations we will be seeing in a case based format which is very important. So I'll read out a case to you. A 25 year old female presents to the clinic complaining of intermittent bouts of diarrhea and lower right quadrant pain not associated with meals. The patient reports that he has been constipated for several days. Your physical examination is significant with a temperature of 100 degree Fahrenheit, several oral ephthysulcers and a palpable right lower quadrant mass. 
the patient also complains of migratory joint pains and periodic burning sensation in the eyes but on examination eye examination was normal the perianal region is normal upon examination but the guaiac test is positive for occult blood you order an upper gi series and small bowel follow through to look for evidence of ulcers strictures or fistulas as you suspect that the patient symptoms may be associated with a chronic disease so this was the classical presentation of a patient with crohn's disease from this case we can derive four things first one is etiology second is epidemiology third is morphology and fourth is clinical manifestations so etiology is idiopathic though infectious causes have been suggested epidemiology is it occurs more commonly in females than in males of age 15 to 30 years coming to the morphology gross morphology and microscopic morphology gross morphology i have tried to include as much as image as possible so that it will be clear changes are located to terminal ileum small intestine and colon less commonly in the rectum creeping fat over the bowel surface thickened bowel wall leads to narrowing of the lumen linear ulceration of the mucosa also known as serpentine ulcers and then cobblestone mucosa is very classical of crohn's disease cobblestone mucosa is submucosal edema with elevation of surviving mucosa this was the gross changes now coming to microscopic morphology transmural inflammation means all the four layers of the intestine are involved in the inflammation skip lesions are seen which means areas of normal bowel interspersed between the diseased bowel then fissures are seen and coming to the hallmark of Crohn's disease which is non-caseating granulomas non-caseating means you remember the basics of pathology that is necrosis types of necrosis caseous necrosis was one of them caseous means loss of nuclei from the cell but here non-caseating means you can see intact nuclei as seen clearly in this image now clinical manifestations it's they are classically presented in the case itself that is intermittent bouts of low grade fever diarrhea often with blood only if the rectum is involved and right lower quadrant pain may have right lower quadrant mass on physical examination then extra intestinal manifestation if we see oral aphthous ulcers as we see in this case then erythema nodosum migratory polyarthritis also we are seeing in this case uveitis also we can see then sacroiliitis ankylosing spondylitis and if we come to the complications then fibrous strictures are formed which cause intestinal obstruction leading to constipation or it may also cause perforation perianal fistulas are formed and malabsorption syndrome can also be present if we see the radiologic features after barium swallow on x-ray we can see string sign which represents narrowed bowel lumen and evidence of ulceration is also present stricturing may also be present fistulas of the small intestine or the colon are seen on colonoscopy so this was the discussion about Crohn's disease now coming to the case of ulcerative colitis i'll read out a case to you a 32 year old woman presents to the clinic complaining of blood tinged diarrhea this is very classical of ulcerative colitis blood tinged diarrhea she reports that she had four episodes of loose stools per day with intermittent rectal bleeding for last two weeks on further questioning you learn that she frequently sits on the toilet and with a urge to defecate but does not actually have the bowel movements on physical examination the patient has left lower quadrant tenderness and red blood is visible on the digital rectal examination you decide to order a flexible sigmoidoscopy expecting to see continuous inflammation of the colon with rectal involvement and friable mucosal pseudo polyps this is a classical case of ulcerative colitis so here also we will be seeing etiology epidemiology pathology and clinical manifestations so etiology includes it may be related to immune dysfunction or dysregulation and epidemiology it occurs most commonly in the women between the ages of 20 to 35 and but it can affect all ages if we see the morphology part then gross morphology and microscopic morphology gross morphology includes continuous lesions of the colon with rectal involvement friable mucosal pseudo polyps are seen pseudo polyps are mucosal remnants of previous ulcerations with free hanging mesentery now microscopic morphology if we see then mononuclear inflammatory infiltrates in the lamina propria crypt abscesses and ulcers Dysplastic changes in the epithelial cells, submucosal fibrosis can also be seen and glandular atrophy results from healed disease. Now if we see the clinical manifestations of ulcerative colitis, the patient may present with tenesmus. Tenesmus is urge to defecate with ineffectual straining or chronic diarrhea with blood and mucus. Extra intestinal manifestation of ulcerative colitis if we see then it may be pyoderma gangrenosum which is painful ulcerating boils and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Fibrosing chronic cholestasis that can lead to portal hypertension is primary sclerosing cholangitis. Then complications include severe colonic stenosis. Toxic megacolon is a classical complication of ulcerative colitis. Toxic megacolon is inflammation of the myenteric plexuses which leads to gangrene and increased risk of 
colorectal carcinoma and on imaging we can see lead pipe appearance as you can see in this image very clearly so this was the discussion about ulcerative colitis i trust that you all liked my explanation for the pathology of ibd until next time stay happy stay healthy keep smiling see you soon